rolling camera, I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas, in February of 1996, with a man who has given his life in service to his country and Jesus Christ, Colonel Jack Moore. Colonel Jack Moore is the man that I'm going to be interviewing, and I'm going to have him tell you his story. A story that's very interesting, a story that will help you to see the hand of God providentially moving in his life, where he was called into the service of the king in a most unusual way at the hands of communist torturers and a Korean communist firing squad in Korea many years ago. At that time, Colonel Moore made a promise, and he did something that's kind of unusual when men make a promise to God. In his case, he kept it. And as far as I know, he's been keeping it for up to his 80 years of life now. And I've asked him to share the journey of his life from the time he made that promise and to tell the story that took place there in Korea, and also to tell you about a discovery that he made in his service to the king and for his country for these many years. Colonel Moore, I thank you for agreeing to this interview. And of course, you and I sort of got together in 1984 when I had you come speak at my church. And uh, I might say to my viewing audience that my life was sort of turned upside down as a result of Colonel Moore coming to speak at our church. We had the ministerial alliance, the media, and the public wrath turned against us. And when I say turned upside down, I say that it was turned upside down for the better. And from that time forward, my eyes have been more open, and God has certainly been leading as a result of Colonel Moore coming into my life. And I think that as he tells you the story that took place in his life, you can see the leading of God, and you'll probably make a discovery, as I did along the way, just as Colonel Jack Moore did, that will change your life. Colonel Moore, since we've only got one camera in the studio today, I'm going to ask you the question, just to ask you to tell the viewing audience the answer, but I'd first of all like to start with sort of a biographical sketch of uh, Colonel Jack Moore up to the time of Korea. Mm-hmm. Well, I was, uh, I was raised up, I was the first baby boy born in Chicago in 1916. In fact, for many years, because of the fact that I was embarrassed to tell people that I was born at the Presbyterian Women's Hospital, I used to tell them I was born in Soldier's Field, which wasn't true. But and anyway, uh, I, I grew up in, as a small boy in, in central Michigan. I was an orphan. My mother and father were killed in an automobile accident when I was two years old. I was raised by a farm family in central Michigan until I got into my 20s. And uh, then I went to, uh, to Moody Bible Institute. I wanted to become a choir director, and I went there and, and studied the music under George Beverly Shea, uh, who is quite well known in the, in the fundamental uh, music uh, circles. And, uh, and then in, uh, uh, right after Pearl Harbor, I was in Chicago at the time, working in the, at the, in the Pure Oil Building in, in Chicago, and. Uh, when Pearl Harbor took place, and I was one of those fellows that went down all sorry-eyed with patriotism and signed up uh, the next day to uh, defeat uh, in this war that was uh, going to end all wars and that was going to save democracy. And uh, I went to uh, basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and and then down through uh, maneuvers in Louisiana and out into the desert. and then went overseas with uh, George Patton's 2nd Armored Division to North Africa as a, as a buck sergeant. And uh, over there I won a battlefield commission at Kasserine Pass and uh, was wounded and spent most of the war years in the States, uh, most of them at uh, uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And uh, then in the end of the war, uh, had some combat duty in the South Pacific and uh, finally up into Japan on occupation duty. In fact, I was with the occupation ship that was on its, uh, or the occupation fleet that was on its way to Japan for what we thought was going to be the invasion of Japan when the two nuclear bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the war ended. I had a year and a half occupation duty in Japan where I learned to speak the language and then uh, came back to the States in the spring of 1946 and and got a discharge and went up to North Dakota uh, where my wife's people were living at the time and uh, uh, took up ranching. 
I, uh, uh, I didn't have a very good, I didn't have much success as a rancher. I, the first year that I was up there, I put out 5,000 acres of wheat, one of the most beautiful crops that I'd ever seen. And 10 days before harvest, a hailstorm came through. And uh, when I harvested the crop, I think I cleared $56 profit for about the, one of the hardest summer's work that I'd ever put in. And then uh, that same spring, I had a tractor turn over on me and put me in the hospital for several months. And I was pretty much fed up with farming or ranching by the time that I, uh, by I finished there. And uh, then in the spring of 1948, I received a letter from the Department of Army. And they said, we're looking for men that can speak Japanese. And we noticed from your record that you could. And... Uh, uh, we'd like to have you go back into active duty. We'll give you back your uh, rank of first lieutenant, and we'd like to have you go over to Korea as a member of the Korean Military Advisory Group to train the infant South Korean uh, uh, Army that was just being built up at that time. So that's how you got to Korea, and obviously God had other plans for you as far as harvest goes. It wasn't going to be a harvest of wheat, mm -hmm. but... Uh, at that point in time, your Christianity, what was it, just nominal? I would, just, I would say that. I'm not, I, was, I'm, I wouldn't even be sure now, looking back on it, whether I was saved or not. I had one of these experiences that a lot of so-called Christians had. I'd gone forward to the church altar and, and uh, cried a few tears and signed a, uh, read a little prayer that was handed to me on a card and uh, signed a commitment card and was baptized and joined the church, but I'd never been a very what you'd call a dedicated Christian, I guess what you'd call a nominal Christian. I went to church when the Spirit led me. I uh, gave to the Christian causes when the Spirit led me, which wasn't very often, and uh, I didn't study my Bible very much. And I was one of those Christians that uh, when I did read my Bible and I came to a portion of it that I didn't understand, I went to my minister and asked him what it meant. I never took time to uh, go into it and dig into it myself and see what it really said. And so as a result, I came up with some, I didn't know it at the time, but later on found out some ideas that were rather twisted in my thinking. Well, God had a plan for you, and it started with a communist coup. Tell the story. Yeah, evidently he did, and uh, sometimes it, it appears, my experience has been that uh, sometimes God has to knock people up alongside the head pretty hard to get them to listen. I was one of those extra hard-headed guys. I didn't learn very easy, and so I had to get smashed down and, and uh, knocked around and bloodied a little bit before I was willing to listen to what he wanted me to do. But in the fall of, uh, or I, when I got to Korea, I was sent down to the southwest section of Korea uh, to a little town called Yosu in the province of Chalonamdo. It was down the, on, the, on the southwest corner of the Korean peninsula. And uh, I was sent down there to work as an advisor with the 19th Infantry Regiment, which was uh, uh, the ship Sionde Regiment of the, of the uh, uh, South Korean Army. And uh, I was the only American down there for eight months, uh, uh, living with uh, Korea, not knowing the Korean language very well, but speaking Japanese. I could get along with most of them pretty well. Most of them spoke Japanese because They'd been under Japanese occupation for 45 years and studied it in the school. So I was able to get along with them pretty well. But uh, it was a difficult job of taking farm boys that had never seen an electric light before. They'd never ridden in a motor vehicle of any kind and to try and turn them into modern soldiers with uh, uh, mechanical equipment. It was quite a difficult job. Uh, for instance, one, uh, one of the first examples that I saw was a young fellow that we brought in, and he spent all one night standing at a light switch, turning the lights on and off all night long until finally the sergeant <laughs> made him go to bed. He'd never seen an electric light before, and it was difficult for us to comprehend that. We also ran into a very difficult situation in that most of the officers had been men that had fought in the Japanese army, and as a result, they had the Japanese idea of discipline. In other words, if a man did something that you didn't like, you hauled off and hit him up alongside the head of your rifle butt, or, and they were very brutal. And as a result of that, we had a great deal of, of difficulty in, uh, in uh, trying to get 
information across to the lower ranking men because many times the officers were the ones that stood in our way. What we didn't know at the time was that there was a very strong communist element that was operating within the Korean army. Evidently at the end of World War II there was a special school begun in Pyongyang uh, in North Korea, the capital of North Korea. Uh, this was in 1945 and it was uh, begun for young men from both North and South Korea where they were being trained to interfilter across the 38th parallel and get involved in the military apparatus of South Korea. Evidently their idea was that instead of having an invasion like they had in 1950, they were going to take over by a military coup. And uh, the, their plans evidently came to a head in the, oh, it was the 28th of November, 1948. Uh, I was not with my unit at the time. I was up at division headquarters, which is about 100 miles north of there. And uh, in my regiment of about 3,800 men, about 2,500 of them joined this rebellion that took place. It didn't break out nationwide because uh, something went wrong with their plans and it only broke out in five or six different places. But my regiment happened to be one of the ones where it really broke out seriously and about 2,500 out of the 3,800 men joined the uh, communist rebellion. Um, there were about 75 infiltrators, as near as we can figure. Uh, one night they, they went down and uh, uh, they killed off most of the loyal officers and then broke into the armory and we just had a shipment of a million uh, M1 Durand rifles that had come in from the states and or not a million, but 2,000 rifles and a million rounds of ammunition, and they took this over and then marched into the little city of uh, uh, Yosu, which was about five or six miles away, and uh, killed off the police department and set up our people's court and uh, uh, began a communist occupation of this area. They then marched up to the city of Sunchan, which was about 20 miles north of there, and Sunchan. Uh, the, the word Sunshine in Korean means peaceful heaven. Very, very lovely area. It was situated in, a, in the center of a large plain uh, surrounded by mountains on three sides. The southern uh, section of it was the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Yalu Sea. These mountains were high enough that they had snow on them in the summertime. And it was a very, very fertile rice producing area. Also some of the most wonderful hunting in the world, especially bird hunting. You've never seen anything like it. And nothing at all to see a flock of 90 cock pheasants out in the rice paddy at one time. And uh, geese came in by the hundreds of thousands in the fall. That uh, I've been uh, hunting out here at Stuttgart, uh, Arkansas on occasion, which is one of the prime duck hunting areas here. Nothing like they had in Korea. Just amazing. And uh, it was also the Christian center of, uh, of South Korea. The, the Roman Catholic Church had had a mission station there for about 48 years. I think the Southern Presbyterians had been in there for about 45 years. And I think one of the reasons why they set up their headquarters in this uh, city was because of the Christian influence there, because they had the idea uh, and the follow-up from communism since that time has been that in order to control people, you must control the moral and the spiritual aspect. You've got to destroy the moral and spiritual aspect of people before you can control them and make slaves out of them. So they set up a, their regular communist apparatus there, which was a what they call a people's court. It's a very unusual. We don't have anything like it in, a, in this country or in the free world. It's made up of a judge, a prosecuting attorney, and the victim. If you happen to be a member of what they call the bourgeoisie, that's a property owner of any kind at all, you can be brought before this court. Uh, you don't have a defense counsel. You don't get a chance to speak in your own defense. Uh, they tell you about, uh, the prosecutor uh, tells about all the crimes that you've committed against the government, and then the judge pronounces sentence against you. Usually it's a death sentence, and the more brutal the execution is carried out, the better it is for their purposes because it scares people, you see. And so people are taken out and they're killed in, in the most brutal uh, ma uh, manner possible. And this in itself uh, begins to control people. Now, uh, to give you an idea of that, when, when this revolt broke out, 
I received word about 5 o'clock in the morning. I was about 100 miles away uh, at the uh, province capital of Quanzhou uh, when we heard about this. I wasn't very much upset by this revolt at first because uh, we had sort of known that there was going to be some problems uh, because at that time uh, a large number of the South Korean Army uh, personnel were jailbirds. Now, I'll qualify that by saying that uh, in those days, if a young man got in trouble with the law, the judge many times would tell him, you got a choice, either go into the army or we're going to put you in jail. So they joined the army, and they didn't like the police. Police were very, very brutal anyway, and, uh, and sort of a throwback to the old Japanese system. And so there was a constant fight between the, uh, the, the police and the, and, the, uh, and, and the Korean soldiers. And many, many times on a Monday morning, I'd have to take a truck and go into Yosu and bail out 40 or 50 of the boys that got thrown into jail over the weekend for fighting with the police. So when this thing broke out, uh, they were very, very uh, anxious and being uneducated boys and not knowing much about what was going on when these leaders said, well, look, we're going to take over control of the country. You go along with us and you're going to be the big shots in the government. That set pretty well with them. They sounded pretty good to them. So when I got down to Yosu, I took a company of, of infantry along with me, 100, about 185 five South Korean troops and we drove down about 90 miles down through the mountain roads and and got down there and found out instead of just a little thing it was a real full-grown uh, fight going on. The city of uh, Yosu or, or of Sunshine, uh, about 150 population, uh, was very easily defended because on the south side of the city there was a very a uh, fast-flowing deep river with only one bridge across it. So all you had to do is defend that bridge and you could pretty well defend the city from the invasion from the south. So I took my infantry company and put them in charge there and said, I don't want any of the Imingu and the, uh, the communists to come across this bridge. And then I went down to look for the police chief who was down in the center part of the city. I came back about an hour later and here the communists were coming across the bridge by droves. And I got a hold of the young lieutenant that was in charge, and I said, Chewy, lieutenant, uh, why are you letting the Imingun come across? And he said, oh, Morsan, he said, right after you left, uh, a man came across with a white flag, and he told us their plans and how they're going to take over the control of the country. And if we would join them, we would be the big shots in the new government. And we thought it was good, and so my company joined them. So that left me with about 45 policemen. And they were down in the police station in the center part of the town. And over there, the police stations were sort of like medieval castles. This one had a 10-foot walls around it, had turrets on the corners, even had a moat around the outside with water in it. Somebody said they had alligators in. I never saw any. But anyway, it was an old-fashioned type of a thing. And the policemen had withdrawn into this fort. I was under orders, very strict orders at that time, that I was not to get involved in any fighting. They said, your job down there is an as observer, so don't get involved. Uh, keep out of the fighting and just let us know what's going on. So I went into the, uh, I went into the, uh, uh, the police station along with these men, and all during that afternoon and that evening, there was a fierce firefight went on. Our pl the policemen were armed with the old Arasika bolt-action rifle, which is sort of like our old O3 rifle and uh, were used by the Japanese during World War II, and they would crank around into the chamber, stick the gun up over the wall, pull the trigger, come down again, and, and never stuck their head over the wall to aim or anything, and I don't think all day long we ever hit anybody on our side. I think we lost eight men on our side, and uh, I asked him, I said, why don't you stick your head up over the wall to aim it? Well, he said, we can't do that because they'll see us and shoot at us if we do that. So by the end of the afternoon, we were running short on ammunition. So uh, I hadn't had any sleep in over, over 24 hours, and I was leaning up against the wall, fast asleep, when one of the, one of the policemen came over and he said, Chewie, one of the Imingun wants to talk to you, one of the communists wants to talk to you. And so I looked over the wall, and here on the other side of the street, uh, sticking his head out around the corner with a white rag tied on his bayonet and waving it like that was this guy. He said, I want to talk to the Migu Komenkwan, the American advisor. I said, that's me. What do you want? Well, he said, we're going to storm the police station any minute now, and anybody that's in there, we're going to kill them. But if you want to come out, or any of the policemen want to come out, 
we'll promise you safe conduct. Well, when you get in a situation like that, immediately the wheels in your mind start going around at a rapid rate. How can I get out of this mess that I'm in? And so thinking back to my orders, don't get involved, nor being the fact that I'd worked with these guys and had been friends with many of them, I thought maybe I could talk them into uh, stopping what they were doing. So I came out with a tall policeman, if I remember, 12 or 13, I don't remember exactly, and uh, they didn't bother me at all. I was armed. I had a 45 pistol strapped on my waist, and uh, they were quite courteous. Some of them saluted, some of them shook hands with me. They were quite friendly. But as soon as we were outside of the, uh, where they couldn't fire at us from the wall, they grabbed these policemen, tied their hands behind them, and they don't tie your wrists, but they take your thumbs and wire them together with fine wire like picture wire, which is very, very effective. And then they uh, took them down in front of the courthouse where there was sort of a, well, there was four-lane traffic with a, you know, like a flower bed down the center of it. They stripped these guys to the waist, forced them to lean in, uh, kneel down in the street, and then they executed them with bamboo spears. Now, for many, many years in the Orient, they didn't have firearms, and so when they wanted to hunt, uh, they'd uh, go out and cut down a, a bamboo, like a bamboo fishing pole, maybe an inch and a half, two inches in diameter, uh, sharpen a point on it, and uh, bamboo has the strange... Uh, uh, property that if you put it in the flame of a fire and turn it around very slowly, it hardens until it's like uh, steel, and the edges are just like the cutting edge of a sharp knife. And they executed these guys by just jabbing them in the chest and abdomen until they were dead. Well, now while this was going on, I had noticed uh, activity going on in the courtroom, the courthouse, which was just down the street a little bit, and did some inquiring as to what was going on. They said, oh, they're setting up a people's court down there. I noticed out in front of that people's court there was a bamboo pole, probably three inches in diameter and maybe five foot tall. It was set maybe, oh, maybe five foot off the ground. And uh, while we were wondering what that was for, uh, there was a commotion in the crowd and uh, four men came out dragging the police chief. He was a little short guy, maybe uh, five foot, four inches tall, weighed probably 185 pounds, a little guy by the name of Chung Sun Si, and they just picked that guy up and rammed him down onto that sharpened point to where it ran up into his body. And of course, he was screaming and hollering and making a real fuss. And while this was going on, they brought out his wife, who was a young girl, maybe 25 years of age, that looked like she was close to nine months pregnant, stripped her of her clothes, raped her over and over again, probably 15 or 20 times, and then literally chopped her up with her bayonets. Uh, as I said, I was under orders not to get involved, but sometimes you reach a point where you have to get involved. And when I saw them slice their breasts off with my, their bayonets, that was more than I could take, and I reached back for my pistol. I don't ha know now, it w have any idea what, what I was going to do, but uh, somebody knocked me over the head, and when I woke up, I was laying down in the prison cell down under the, under the courthouse. Well... <coughs> When you were there in the prison cell, uh, go ahead and tell the people, if you don't mind, and just speak into the camera, what you had to endure, because we are told today that communism is dead. Of course, we know that when we were told that news, that not all the communists died. Mm -hmm. And people in America still have a hard time understanding the brutality of that system. Well, uh, Pete, the reason, uh, you don't mind me calling Pete, we're old friends, you know. <laughs> I don't but, mind at all. But uh, for, uh, it's difficult for the average American to understand a culture that has, no, that has not been softened by the Christian background. In America, uh, even people that have never been inside the doors of a church, the culture that they live just from having been in this country it has softened them to a certain extent as far as their sentiments are concerned and their feelings are concerned. To normally, the normal person doesn't want to go out and hurt a child or, or a woman in particular, you see. But over there where you have no, none of this softening of the, of the culture at all, uh, the more brutal you are, it shows not only the fact that you're stronger than the other guy, but it also scares hell out of the people, and, and that's exactly what they want to have happen. So and, Tell about the brutality that they, they inflicted. Well, on you. Uh, 
I was laid in the prison cell there a couple of days, and then they took me up to the courthouse, which was a, it was a large room, I guess probably the size of maybe four basketball uh, floors. Uh, no chairs in it. It was packed with people, maybe 2,000 people in, and up in the front there was a, a big heavy oak table uh, that was uh, uh, sitting there with a, an old-fashioned oak chair. Maybe you remember, I'm sure many of you remember the old-fashioned chairs with the big heavy wooden arms and so on. And then at one end of the table there was a little civilian man in a, uh, one of those high Mao Tung jackets wearing one of those little skull caps and he was sitting there uh, doing some writing. And I stood in front of the table for a few minutes and finally I spoke to him in Korean and I said, I'm an American officer, I want to uh, be turned loose. And he began to scream at me in Korean, how can a running dog of the capitalist imperialist Wall Street warmonger ask anything of a representative of the people? Sit down. And so I sat down in the chair. He came over, put his arm around me, and he said, we don't hate Americans, but everybody knows that you people are over here. You don't want to be over here, but you're over here because your government forces you to come over. And all we want you to do is cooperate with us and nothing, and we'll turn you loose. I said, what do you want me to do? Well, he brought out a parchment that was oh, maybe 18 inches long, and we're on uh, using the picturesque uh, language, of, uh, Korean language, very similar to the Chinese characters. They had written 32 different things that America wanted to do to Korea. One of the laughable things I remember looking back on it, one of them was that we wanted to make a state out of Korea. Well, if you were in Korea at that time, all you had to do was smell the rice paddies and you knew that you wouldn't want to have that as a state. But this is one of the things that they had asked. I don't know why, thinking back on it, but uh, whether I shook my head, I don't remember shaking my head, I don't remember saying no, but all of a sudden the man behind me slapped me up against the side of the head, knocked me out of the chair, and he booted me a couple of times as I lay on the ground and then grabbed me and yanked me back up into the chair again. And then this little guy stood in front of me and I remember him shaking his finger in my face right at the end of my nose and screaming at me so loud that he was spitting all over me. And he said, you either do what I tell you to, you're going to wish you'd never been born. Well, you know, when you got two guys that are angry facing each other, that can be a volatile situation. And as I said, he was so angry he was spitting all over me and I didn't like what had happened to me, and I made a bad mistake, and I spit back at him, and I shouldn't have done that, because he was in the driver's seat. And he barked an order in Korea, and then before I could stop him, they grabbed me. Uh, four or five men jumped on me and stripped me of every stitch of clothes I had, including my socks, and tied me down in that chair, wired me in with wire to where I couldn't move, and then they brought over a long wire with a clamp on the end of it, hooked it up to one of my nipples and then tied the other end around my penis and then played a little game of asking questions and turning on a switch of electricity. I can't remember the pain. Looking back on it, I don't remember the pain. It was just like a giant forest picking me in that chair up in the air and then when the electricity come on, smashing us into the ground. Just a terrific shot. And it seemed like it went on all afternoon. I'm sure it was only a few seconds and I passed out and when I came to, I was laying back in that prison cell. Now, I was, I said, I was a boy that was a nominal Christian. I hadn't gone to church in a long time. I hadn't read my Bible. hadn't prayed. I hadn't been living a Christian life anyway at all. When I began doing some high, high and heavy praying, I'll tell you, when I was there, I began to remember some things that I'd been taught as a, a boy in church and Sunday school and so on. And it seemed like the more I prayed, the, it seemed like my prayers were hitting that ceiling up above me and bouncing right back down on me. The more I prayed, the more frustrated I got. One day I was kneeling in the straw when a guy turned on the light. It was complete darkness. You couldn't see a thing. All you could do was hear the rats running around in the straw. And one of the guys came in and found me kneeling in the straw and he said, oh, you're a Christian, are you? What are you praying to your God for? He can't do anything for you. Why don't you pray to me? And he hit me up alongside the head, knocked me down on the ground and then beat me insensible as I lay on the ground. This went on for a number of days, and uh, uh, finally, I guess maybe the 10th or 12th day, I can't remember for sure, they, they, oh, they came in and played little games with me, like tying me up by my heels from a, a beam where I could just touch the floor with the tips of my fingers, and then beating on my, on my back and on my, the, the distended muscles with uh, thin 
uh, steel rods about as big as your finger, like sort of that were flexible like a fish rod. And just a, uh, I can't explain the sensation of pain that is caused by that sort of thing on distended muscles. And other little games that they played that, that I, I don't want to go into right now. Did they not take you also out in the public square and tie you up for them to throw? Yeah, the yes, they did. One of those days, they took me out and they, they, uh, they took a, a steel needle about that long with a leather thong on it and ran it down here under the nipple of my right breast and tied me up to a pole. And I, my hands tied behind me and I was still stripped completely naked and just left me there. And the little kids had a field day throwing uh, vegetables at me and horse manure and the women had come up and poke me and make vulgar remarks about me and this sort of thing. And uh, I stayed there, uh, I stood up I guess, several, I don't know how many hours that day in the hot sun and until I finally passed out and, and snapped the cord and, as I fell down and they hauled me back to the prison cell. A couple of days later they took me up to be sentenced. And I remember as I came in the back of the room, uh, now I had I'd done some heavy praying. I said, the, uh, I, I, for the first time in my life I got down to nitty gritty with God. And I knew what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing that time when I'd gone forward five or six different times in a church altar, but I knew what I was doing there. And I said, God, I'm not going to get out of this mess unless you help me. And I promise you that if you get me out of this mess and get me back with the people I love and the uh, country that I love, I'll do everything in my power to see that what I saw happen in this area here will never come to our people. That's the driving force in my life today. And uh, they took me up to the court for sentencing. Sometime during the night, Somebody had brought in an old raggedy pair of pants and they'd thrown them in and I was able to get into those. And they took me in and I remember as I came in, uh, there were double doors, swinging doors in the back and standing up against the wall was a, a Korean sergeant by the name of Yu Chung Nam. We called him Paksa, which means uh, professor in Korean. He was a high school history teacher in civilian life. He'd been a friend of mine and he spoke pretty good English. He had gone to the Presbyterian school and uh, I said, Pox, for God's sakes, help me. And he just lashed out, hit me with the back of his hand across the mouth and to where he started my nose bleeding and screamed at me in Korean, Prabhu Michange Chita Honda. As close as I can translate it is, you stupid crazy dog drop dead from a heart attack. And went stomping up to the front of the room, screaming and hollering about how he hated all Americans, how I was the worst one he'd ever known. And, all the bad things I'd done against the Korean people and he said I'd like to take this American bastard out and shoot him. And he created enough of a of a uh, impression I guess on the civilian judge that he gave him permission and Paksa went out and was gone maybe ten minutes and came back with eight men with rifles and they took me out of the courthouse. As we went out he whispered something to me rather strange. He said uh, Morris on when the rifles fire fall down dead. Well, I didn't know what he meant, but that's usually the thing that happens when they're aimed at you and the, somebody pulls the trigger. Normally in a firing squad, you don't have to be told to fall No, down that's dead. right. But uh, they took me down a little old cobblestone road, about eight blocks away, I guess, and they drove away some of the curious onlookers that wanted to go along with them. I remember standing in front of this stone wall, and I was clenching my fists and gritting my teeth because I knew I'd had it. And I can remember just as clearly as if it was yesterday that the man, as he gave the orders in Korean for the guns to, to be, the rifles to be raised, I heard him give the command to fire, and I heard the guns go off, and I was still alive. So I figured they must have shot over my head. So I fell down like I'd been hit, and he came up and bent over me like he was checking me out, and he, he said to, in a low voice where nobody could hear, he said, more son, as soon as we're gone and the coast is clear, go up to the Moksa's house. Go up to the missionary's house on Masan Hill and I'll try and smuggle you out of the city if I get a chance. And he stood up and spit on me and cursed me out and kicked me in the ribs and marched off with his men. And uh, when the coast was clear, I was able to uh, drag myself up to the missionary's house and uh, where I stayed until the, until the government troops came in about 10 days later. During that period of time, I was in a position where I could see some of the atrocities that are committed in a communist country. 
For instance, we were on the only hill in the city, which is like a little chocolate drop in the center of the city, and the mission station looked down into the courtyard of the mission school section, the girls' section over here. During those 10 days, I counted 47 little girls between the ages, I would say, 12 and 15, that were dragged out into the courtyard, stripped and raped, and beaten to death or bayoneted to death, 47 of them saw a number of occasions of young women being, with babies in their arms, being chased by soldiers. I remember one that I guess I'll never forget of a small, um, a baby, a mother with a small baby, maybe uh, just a few weeks old, being chased by two drunken soldiers, and they caught her, took the baby away from her, and then stood maybe 10 feet apart and played a little game of tossing the baby back and forth and catching it on the points of their bayonets. And when one of them began to scream and holler, or when she began to scream and holler, one of them reversed the butt of his rifle and knocked her to the ground and beat her to death as she lay on the ground. Uh, the mission station, or the, the Catholic church, was just across the street, and uh, they nailed two nuns up against the wall of the church by driving bayonets through the palms of their hands and then under their rib cage here where it didn't kill them. And they screamed and hollered up against the wall of that church for eight or ten hours before they passed out. I was in the window of the mission station with a rifle in my hands, praying to God whether I ought to shoot those uh, women to put them out of their misery, and I was afraid to do anything because we had seven American women in the mission station. We were afraid they'd come up and, and do the same thing to them. And then on the last day before the government troops came in, they, uh, they brought out a young girl, probably 20 years of age, a real beautiful girl, stripped her of her clothes nailed her to a branch of a tree with spikes like that driven through her bare breast and left her hanging there and then took a, a bundle of rice straw that had been dipped in oil and bound it between her bare thighs and set on fire. And I tell you, Pete, when I saw that, I, 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 I come close to cracking up, I'll tell you. And I re resolved that if God helped me, if I ever got back here, I was going to fight this thing if it, meant, if it meant my life. I was going to fight this thing with everything I've had. And I'm like the Datsun people now. I am driven. <laughs> people wonder sometimes. They said, oh, you're a radical. You're a, you're, you're a kook. I said, I may be a radical and I'm a kook, but I've got a reason for being radical, I tell you, because I've seen it and gone through it. And then uh, a, a, I was given the opportunity then, to, uh, when the government troops came in, they said, you can either go back to, you can either go to Japan or you can go back to the States, take your pick. And I realized that if I left that area, I'd always have in the back of my mind the fear of this thing that I'd seen. And so I made one of the hardest decisions I'd ever made, and I asked them to send me back to the area where I'd been captured. And so I went back there and spent uh, nine months in that area. It was actually a combat area because uh, these rebels had scattered and gone into the hills, and they were being supplied by an underground coming from North Korea. And uh, for nine months, we had, a, during 1949, we had over 500 casualties in the regiment. I was shot at three different times in roadblocks, and uh, so this, led, this was the thing that led up to the, to the beginning of the Korean War then. I not wanted to interrupt you. I want to just have you tell the story just like you're telling it. We haven't even got to your work back in the States, but mm. I want to, before we get to you coming back to the States, I want you to go ahead and tell the story of the Korean War itself. Now, you're one of the most highly decorated men to come out of the Korean War, isn't that correct? Well, I, I left the, the area uh, uh, after about nine months uh, in the early part of 1950. I was transferred up to Seoul and was made advisor of a infantry battalion that was at a little town called Pochan, which was about 18 miles north of Seoul on one of the major invasion routes into the, into the uh, city. Now what I want you to tell as you tell this story, uh, Colonel Moore, is what you told me privately several years ago about some of the treason that you witnessed yeah. coming from the State Department. Yeah, this I'm, 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 trying, to, I'm okay. trying to lead into that. Yeah. Good. Just go now, right on. The, uh, when the war broke out, they immediately began evacuating. Well, my, my unit was overrun. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, for six months before the war began, uh, we had turned in reports. By we, I'm talking now about the advisors of the units along the 38th parallel, 
had been turning in reports of North Korean buildup. We were at that time under the State Department, and we had to report to a State Department colonel. And uh, many, many times, uh, I would have this guy actually sneeringly say to me, you guys see a communist under every rock and behind every bush. And I remember one day that uh, uh, I got a little angry, and I said, if you'd get up off your big ass and go up there where the action was, you'd see them too. Well, the lieutenant doesn't say that to a bird colonel, so I got in trouble with it. But anyway, we, uh, the night before, uh, the day before the war began, and my unit, which we had about, I guess, about 850 men. The enemy moved in, and a regiment, uh, or an infantry division of about 11,000, there had been a one company of infantry there. They moved in an infantry division. They moved in a regiment of mounted horse cavalry, about 1,800 of them, and they moved in 76 tanks. We'd never seen a heavy tank in that area before. Now, I was under orders that to report to this bird colonel any time no matter when, when I saw something that I thought he ought to know. So when I got back to Seoul that night, it was sort of late, I checked the colonel and he was having a party with some big shots from Tokyo at the officers club. So I went, broke in on his party. I was filthy dirty. I'd just driven 30 dusty miles and a hard day out in the field. And he didn't appreciate me at all, but I broke in to tell him what, and he got very angry with me and ordered me out of the place. And then at 4 o'clock the next morning, I get a telephone call from his unit. You better get up with your unit. They're coming across all on the 38th parallel. Oh, I forgot. I, I got ahead of myself a little bit. In a briefing that morning, this man stood up and said, there's no sign of any enemy activity. Go to the party tonight if you want to. And as a result of that, there were not any more than 15% of the advisors who were in a condition to be with their men when the fighting broke out. I had had a, a little scrap with my wife the night before and we didn't go to the party, otherwise I might have been with them too. But anyway, when this party broke out the next morning, and I got up there to find my unit under heavy, heavy attack. We didn't have any artillery support of any kind. And uh, I got my uh, the first declaration of the war that morning by trying to, t to stop two enemy tanks with a, a small anti-tank gun that just, the shells just bounced off the, uh, the tank and didn't do any good at all. But they began evacuating the, uh, the, the people. In fact, I got back, I had to walk back uh, 38 miles to Seoul because my jeep had been destroyed by a tank. And I got there just in time to kissed my wife goodbye as they were hauling her off to, to put them on a Norwegian fertilizer ship down in Inchon, the, the women and children, to take them back to Japan. I was on the last plane load that was to leave from Japan, and before we could leave, I think there were 15 of us, and before we got a chance to leave, one, a fighter plane landed and said, we've just received word from MacArthur's headquarters that Truman is sending in the Navy and the Air Force, so you're to stay here and go back and s to headquarters and see if you can do anything to help them. So uh, we went back to headquarters and uh, uh, that first night, and then the next day they be had evacuated, evacuated everybody except in the uh, all the civilians, with the exception of the ambassador William Bu uh, Musio, and two of his flunkies were still there. On the outskirts of Seoul at that time, there was an, a gasoline dump that had just come in from the States a couple of weeks before. There was a million 40-gallon barrels of gasoline. And we didn't want the North Koreans to get that, and they were already breaking through our defenses on the north side of the city. So I went down to the ambassador's office with a major from Bismarck, North Dakota, followed by the name of Paul, uh, Paul, uh, uh, that doesn't matter, and I can't remember his last name right now. But we went down there to get permission to burn it. And the ambassador literally cursed us out of his office. He said, I'm sick and tired of you military trying to tell me how to run this war. Get out of here, I'll, I'll tell you when to burn it. And as a result of that, four hours later, the North Koreans had 40 million gallons of gasoline from America, enough to run their tanks for four months. What was the name of that ambassador? Hmm? Do you remember the name of that ambassador? 
The name of the what? Of the ambassador. Yeah, William C. Musio, M-U-C-C-I-O. He left uh, the next day for Japan, and uh, my commanding officer told Major, oh, Major Hedstrom, Paul Hedstrom, told Major Hedstrom and I, I want you to go down to the embassy building and go through it room by room to make sure they didn't leave any reports behind. So we were going through the building. It was a five-story building, and we were going through it, and on the ambassador's office, we found a locked door in the back, and they kicked that in, and in there was an old-fashioned military safe. I'm sure that many of you that have been in the military remember it was uh, made up of steel filing cabinets with a, an iron rod run down through the handles and a padlock on the top. We shot off the padlock, and in there we found the reports from the MAG headquarters of enemy buildup along the 38th parallel for the preceding six months that had never been forwarded to MacArthur's intelligence headquarters in Tokyo. He was uh, Lieutenant General, uh, not Stratemeyer, but uh, Wiedemeyer. So uh, these reports had never got to him. And when the war began, they crucified him in the media because he didn't know what was happening. The reason he didn't know was because the State Department had deliberately withheld reports. So I picked out four of the most incriminating ones, and I stuck them in my pocket. Major Hedstrom said, what are you going to do with them? I said, I'm going to get them back to the States. He said, they'll hang you if they catch you doing it. I said, I don't care. The people need to know about this. And so a couple of days later, I was able to get these into the hands of a young officer who was headed back to the States, and he hand-carried them to Washington, where he gave them to Senator Bill uh, Nolan from California, who at that time was a member of the Armed Forces Committee. Senator Nolan told me later on that when he took those reports before the Senate Armed Forces Committee and tried to read them, that they lapped him off the floor of the Senate saying no American ambassador would do anything like that. Don't talk about it. And he said when I insisted that they do something about it, they began a campaign that finally ran me out of the Senate. This is just one thing. Now, you, when you see things happening like that, you do what we sometimes call Monday morning quarterbacking. You know, you watch the ball game on Saturday, and then Monday morning you say, now if the quarterback would have passed that time instead of run with the ball, we might have had a touchdown. <coughs> Not very long before the, war, uh, before the war began, there was a bird colonel by the name of William Baird. He had 36 years of service. He was probably the most powerful military man, American military man in Korea because he was the advisor of the, of the South Korean National Police which had more men in it than the Army had at that time. He had a very beautiful secretary, I can't remember her name now, a Korean girl who was, had been a professional model. She had worked for him for about three years and uh, when the war uh, uh, we didn't know at that time, but she was the wife of the number two military man in North Korea. For three years, she was using American military police vehicles to take information from Seoul to a little town of Quezon on the 38th parallel where her mother lived, and then her mother would get it across the parallel to her husband. Not only that, but she was shacking up with eight of the top State Department men and had got over two million dollars in State Department funds that she funneled into North Korea. And when the war began, the Korean police took her out and shot her without a trial. But in the meantime, Colonel Baird had been on a ship headed for the States. They arrested him in, in uh, uh, Oakland when he got there un and put him under arrest of quarters pending whether they were going to court-martial him or not. He had a dossier on every one of those people including the ambassador and these eight men in the State Department, had so much dirt on them that they swept everything under the carpet. Musio was sent to Iceland as the ambassador to Iceland. These eight men involved with this girl were all promoted in the State Department, and nothing was said about it in the media. I guess about eight years later, there was a little scandal sheet called pageant. You maybe remember it. It was sort of a format like the Reader's Digest, but more or less of a scandal type of sheet. They had an article in it. That was the only time that the media ever talked about it. And then I began to think, look here, this is just one little old lieutenant seeing this. What's the big picture that's going on all over, you see, in the country with this sort of thing going on? And that was the first time that I actually began to realize the treason that was 
and that was that was ha happening within our own uh, State Department and on our military. And since that time, during my military career, I run into ever several other things. My problem was that I always had a big mouth. I guess I got that from George Patton because George Patton was that way. When he saw something he didn't like, he said it, and he always got in hot water over it. And I did the same way, and I got in hot water over every time. But you know, it, this is a little bit off the subject, but I guess. Uh, be worth putting here. You told me one time that uh, you had the privilege of getting personally chewed out by George Patton. Oh, yes. When, uh, just after I had gotten my commission, uh, George uh, had probably the sharpest eye of any man that I'd ever seen. I had read somewhere that uh, if you were to take nail po polish your brass and put nail polish on it, you'd never have to polish it again. And so I polished up my second lieutenant bars and put some nail polish on it, and I was walking down the street when I ran into General Patton. I gave him a high ball and walked on by him, and I guess I'd gone by about 10 feet when I heard this. He had a real high-pitched feminine voice. He said, Lieutenant! And I turned around and went back and stood at rigid attention in front of me. And he said, if you want to know why the damned army is having so trouble and why the country is going to hell, it's because the damned officers are so damn lazy that they won't even take time to polish their brass anymore. And for about 15 minutes, he went over my ancestry from beginning to end, I mean, until I felt if there had been a crack in the sidewalk, I could have fell right through it. But well, that was the first face-to-face -face confrontation that I had with George Patton. I wanted to put it in here because mm. you're sharing history, and that was a mm. that was a historical moment in your life. Mm -hmm. Chewed out by George Patton. Now you got a uh, what battlefield commissions to colonel in the war, the yeah. Korean War, and not in the Korean War, no, during World War II. During from, World War II. Yeah, from General Patton. But uh, well, now when did uh, you advance to colonel? Were you colonel you, in Korea? You when? When did you become a colonel? Oh. Uh, 1963. 1963, I worked my way up to lieutenant colonel. Well, back in Korea then, uh, of course, you spent the entire war in combat, did you not? Well, I was, uh, I was in front line uh, consec 278 consecutive days of front line duty in the beginning of the war, uh, from um, just a few days after the war began until the spring of 19... Uh, of 1951, I was on the front line, never without any break at all. And uh, uh, I, in addition to the silver star that I got on the first day, I had four bronze stars with the uh, V device, uh, or bronze star, and four uh, uh, clusters, which is the same, at four purple hearts, at two uh, unit accommodations, and uh, uh, two pre or two presidential citations and then I had uh, uh, citation from the Czechoslovakian government and from the uh, uh, Polish government in exile so I came out one of the one of the top ten decorated men in the army I don't know overall what it was but well Colonel Moore we've taken it from the time of your birth up through the end of world war of uh, the Korean War and God allowed you to see firsthand things that most Americans can't even visualize. And then your life goes from there. You try to get the message back to America for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do on the next video is, uh, is to take it up from the time that you came back to the States, how you received Bible training, mm -hmm. how you started lecturing for the John Birch Society, and how you started making discoveries in Scripture, similar discoveries that I've made. Well, Pete, I realized at that time that evidently God must have had something planned for me because there were at least five occasions during the Korean War when I was, should have been blown to bits and I never got anything more than just a few scratches. And, uh, uh, for instance, in the early part of the war, the, uh, uh, the second day of the war, we had no supplies, and so I had gone across the river into the town of Yung Nung Po and it filled my Jeep. The, the American houses, the refrigerators were still going, and we just went in and helped ourselves to the food. Packed the back of the Jeep, and then as a afterthought, I threw a mattress on the top of it, because I didn't have anything to sleep on. 
And as we got up on the highway, there had been one 122-millimeter uh, cannon that had been shooting at us from North Korea. It had been dropping shells all over the area, none of them close to us. But we just got up on the highway, and I was there with my uh, interpreter. When we heard the gun fire again, and immediately I realized that he'd changed aim, and it was going to come pretty close to us. And about that time, a shell come whistling in, and they hit the spare tire in the Jeep blew the whole rear end of the Jeep off, both wheels blew off, and I was hit 97 times from my waist up to the back of, under my helmet, and uh, very few of them, a couple of places under my helmet that broke the skin. Didn't break the skin, but the shrapnel went through that mattress and it was wrapped in cotton batten, and it looked like somebody had pounded me on the back with a board. I was black and blue, but I didn't have any broken skin. And there were Amazing. a number of times, uh, and then just before MacArthur came over on his first trip, uh, I followed his convoy up, and we were strafed by four of our own planes by a mistake. I was with a convoy of South Korean trucks. And uh, one of the F-80s came in from behind me, and uh, came from behind me before I could get out, stop or get out. And uh, the Jeep had 2750 caliber bullet holes in it. A shell came in over either either shoulder, clipped the steering wheel out above my hands and never touched me. So uh, I began to get the idea that maybe somewhere along the line God wanted me to do something. And you say you had five close calls like that. Five close calls like you that. You want to share the others because this is history and someday people are going to be watching Jack Moore tell the story. Well, uh, for instance, one day we were observing uh, artillery fire, our own artillery fire. This was after we had gone across the 38th parallel and were in North Korea. We were observing artillery fire and I had on, it was a winter time, and I had on a, one of those Korean uh, hats with the, uh, fur hats with the helmet. It was warm enough that I had the ear flaps up and I was down behind a hedge with the field glasses observing when a sniper up on the hill, probably a thousand yards away, with a 12, a 12 millimeter uh, sniper rifle, which is, that's about a 56 caliber, fired around. It came through one flap of my, of my hat here and across the top, tore the top out of the hat, threw the other flap and threw my hat 50 foot away and never touched me. <laughs> you begin to think a little bit, you know, when something like that happened. Another day we were out in a schoolyard. Uh, there were four of us talking and we were, we were, uh, about like this group right here, a 120 millimeter mortar round dropped right in front of us, knocked us all down. Not a one of us got a scratch, and a Korean soldier 75 yards away was killed by the shrapnel. Amazing stories. It's amazing, isn't it? So things, things like this, a number of times it happened like that. That it was. Uh, did it ever make you remember your promise to God? Yes, it sure did. And. Um, Sometimes when I got back to the, to the States, right at first, I didn't particularly want to fulfill that uh, promise. I had to get smacked up alongside the head with a tuba for a couple of times before I really began to, to do that. But, uh, well, Colonel Moore, let's uh, break now. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing with posterity mm. these stories. But the next video, we're going to talk about Colonel Moore coming back to the United States trying to tell the American people what he had witnessed and he will then tell us also about the discovery he made along the way, the tie-in of communism to a religious sect, if you will, if you want to call it that, and the discovery about the people who settled the United States of America. So that's going to be in the next video. Colonel Moore, thanks very much. For Thank you, Dean. my friend Colonel Jack Moore. This is actually tape two. We've just taken on tape number one and covered Jack's life from his beginning all the way up through the Korean War. And I've asked Colonel Moore to put this on videotape for posterity's sake. Colonel Moore has actually lived history 
And we're going to try to take on this tape from the time that Colonel Moore returns to the United States. He's made his promise to God at the hands of communist tortures and a Korean firing squad that if God would deliver him, he would spend his life trying to warn the people that he loved in the country that he loved of what he'd seen. And he's been true to that promise. Of course, after the communist torturers, there was the Korean War. And on tape number one, Colonel Jack Moore explained how God many times brought him through some very precarious positions. And obviously, when you hear that story, if you've watched tape number one of this interview, you cannot help but think that God had a plan for Colonel Jack Moore, and he did. And it didn't quit after the Korean War. One thing, Colonel Moore, that I wanted to talk about before we get to you coming to the United States, you had mentioned how you'd had an encounter with General Patton one time, and uh, between breaks on these two tapes, we were talking about General Patton, and uh, of course the history books say that he died by an accidental death. Mm -hmm. Why don't you share what you know about that death of General Patton? Well, it was a very interesting thing about General Patton. He and Eisenhower didn't get along good together, and, or get along at all. And uh, uh, Patton detested Eisenhower, he detested uh, Winston Churchill and FDR, all three of them. He thought that they, were, uh, that they were doing things that were contrary to the good of the United States. And he was very, very outspoken about it. Uh, in fact, he made this statement that uh, when he got back just a short time before his so-called accident, he made this statement that when he got back to the United States, he was going to blow the whistle on him. Now, what um, most Americans don't know that was in the, in 1943, he and General, or in, uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, who was the Field Marshal of the British forces, came up with a plan for the invasion of Germany, which would have gone up from Italy through the soft underbelly of Germany. It would have terminated the war two years earlier. It would have saved millions of lives, billions of dollars, and uh, it was turned down by uh, FDR, uh, Churchill, under the urging of who? Stalin. Well, that particular battle plan would have kept Stalin from getting half of Europe. Well, this is it, you see. And it was turned down, apparently, for the specific reason to allow Stalin to come in and take over all of Eastern Europe. The same time when General Patton was on the, uh, right on the verge of going into Berlin with the American forces, Eisenhower stopped him, made him back up 50 miles and wouldn't supply him with gasoline to allow the British or the, allow the Russian forces to come in and occupy Berlin. Well, at that time he was very angry, of course, and being the type of man that he was, and sounding off rather loud, that when he got back to the states he was going to blow the whistle on him. And one day he was out driving uh, with his uh, staff car, and a, a two and a half ton truck, an army uh, a four by four, came out of a side street. He hit the uh, he hit his command car broadside, then backed up and knocked it into a ditch, and then backed up and rammed it a second time, and then took off. They don't know who it was in, who the drivers were, and anything. He was taken to the hospital, not in real serious condition. The next morning, he was dead. Now, I talked to an orderly who was on the case, who was with General Patton the night before. He was with General Patton until about 11 o'clock that night. And he said when he left, General Patton was in good shape. He was sleeping well. There was nothing wrong with him. And next morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, he was dead, according to the reports. And they said that he came down with a sudden case of pneumonia. That was the official. It's every indication, and more and more of it, that has come out of over the years that he was deliberately murdered to keep him from spreading the truth to the American people. Well, I appreciate you telling that story, so someday people... Jesus once made a statement that the things done in darkness were going to be made manifest in light. 
And What's I think done in secret will be preached in the house, Doc. I think yeah. it's coming to pass, don't you? Yes, I think so, yeah, more and more. Well, tell us about your preaching life then. You came back to the United States after Korea. Go from there. Well, my first experience, I was still in the Army, and because of the fact that I was one of the first officers that had returned from Korea, uh, they put me in the public information office of the 5th uh, Army, or the 6th Army out of uh, uh, the Presidio of California. The headquarters now where Mr. Uh, uh, Gorbachev has now taken over for United Nations headquarters. And they sent me out to lecture any place where I could about the Korean War. The general, and I can't remember his name now, at Fort Ord, California, called me in and said, Moore, there's only one thing I want you to I said, I want you to tell the people the truth. Just make sure you can back up what you say. That's all the restrictions that he put out. And I started out with a, a lecture at a American Legion uh, post in uh, Salinas, California. There was a judge from Los Angeles who was there. He heard me, and he invited me down to Los Angeles. Then I got on the, uh, the some of you remember the, uh, uh, the breakfast club that used to be out in Los Angeles, where every morning at 8 o'clock in the morning, I was on that. That was a radio broadcast at that time. And by word of mouth, it was spread all over. I talked to the state teachers convention and quite a number of universities around. Then in 1960, uh, 1964, I retired, and in 1965, I began what I called my Crusade for Christ and Country, which was a concerted drive to uh, bring the truth to the American people. Let me interrupt you before you get to that. Tell us about your dealings with soldiers and brainwashing and writing the uh, Code of Conduct. Uh, well, I had the opportunity uh, while the war was still going on, this was in 1952 and 1953, uh, of working with uh, Major Gen or not Major General, but Lieutenant Colonel William Meyer, who was the uh, chief psychiatrist, chief army psychiatrist uh, in uh, uh, Tokyo at the Tokyo General Hospital, who was trying to find out what had happened to our POWs in the Korean camp. This was when the term brainwashing was coined. And as a result of working with him, uh, I became known as, uh, I developed the reputation of being an expert. I don't like that term because I found that an expert is normally anybody that's over 50 miles away from home, so I don't like the term expert. But uh, anyway, I had a great deal of experience along that line, and as a result, uh, when the Code of Conduct first came out, I wrote the first lesson plans and taught the first classes that were given to the Army in the uh, Military Code of Conduct at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And so, and then from then, it was a natural when I got out of the service uh, and people found out about my background, they would invite me to speak to a men's club at a church or to uh, a rotary club or something like that. And then by word of mouth, I began uh, speaking in many, many places. Then I uh, attended uh, uh, a prestigious, um, prestigious seminary, uh, Southern Baptist Seminary, and I got two degrees, one a Doctor of Letters and a Master of Theology. I had already attended Moody Bible Institute. I had a Master of Psychology uh, from Minot State College. And uh, I began then to uh, work as an evangelist in the Southern Baptist, and I traveled all over the country. And then about this same time, this was around about 1966, I guess, maybe 67, I was contacted by the John Birch Society and wanted to know if I would sp speak on their American Opinion Speakers Bureau, which was their national uh, lecture uh, bureau. Before we get to that now, as a Baptist evangelist, you've spoken to some of the largest Baptist churches in America, have you Yes, I, the First Baptist down in, uh, in Dallas and... Uh, Bob yeah. Jones University, you spoke yes, to Yes, Bob Jones University and uh, a Tennessee Temple and uh, uh, in, um, Greg Dixon's Indianapolis Baptist te Temple, which is one of the larger of uh, the independent churches. And So at one time, those church doors were open to you to come. Oh, yes, you. yes. I was, I, was welcome in the, I was welcome in the churches and had a, I believe, probably a real successful career as an evangelist ahead of me if I would have kept on in 
well, in I, that evangelistic work. I want to say this, particularly to my listening audience, that uh, Colonel Jack Moore is one of the finest preachers I've ever heard. Some of his evangelistic messages are, are awesome. They're very inspiring and moving, and I've had the privilege of, of hearing him preach before crowds. And uh, don't let him kid you, he might be 80 years old, but he's still got plenty of preach in him. So I just wanted to put that in there. Maybe one of these times uh, people have a chance to hear one of your tapes, mm -hmm. preaching and that type of thing. Let's go back to uh, the uh, John Birch Society contacting you. There. Yeah, I am the, uh, the John Birch Society, and they, when I first started, uh, with the John Burt Society, the head of the Speaker's Bureau uh, was a little bit leery because my messages were very strongly spiritually based. I remember the first uh, message that I gave, uh, the Vietnam War was going on and the, the title of the lecture was The Missing Alternative is Victory. And uh, I, I had to send in a transcript of the message before I gave it to, to the headquarters in Belmont. I got a letter back from him and it said, we can't use this speech because uh, you, you're, you're, you're overemphasizing the religious part of it and you've got to remember there's going to be Catholics, there's going to be Jews, there's going to be other uh, non-Christian people that are going to be listening to you. And I said, well, if I couldn't emphasize the spiritual end of it, then you don't want me in the John Birch Society because I won't speak for anybody unless I can do that because I said, that's the heart of it. So the first, they said, well, we'll let you go on a, this one tour down in Florida and southern Georgia. I think I had 18 speaking engagements, and we'll see what the reaction is. They had such a, a strong reaction from my lecture and said, this is what we've been looking for. This is what we've needed all along, that they said they're going to, from then on, they pretty well turned me loose and let me say pretty much what I wanted to say. And um, about that same time, uh, and they were very, very cooperative with my, with my evangelistic work, and they would build their lecture tours around the open spaces that I had in my speaking engagement. So I was able to, during a few years period of time, I spoke in a little over 3,800 communities, I guess in every state with the exception of Maine. I never did speak in Maine. And on five different foreign countries during that period of time. So I got a lot of coverage there, uh, uh, as far as my speaking was concerned. But I began to notice something that I had never seen before. And I want you to... Before you mm -hmm. get to that, I, I want to make a, a point here I think is interesting. You, you, made it through the, you made it through the Korean War with some of the closest calls, yet uh, I know that you were physically attacked at times during your speaking engagements, like from the SDS, the old Students for Democratic Society. And uh, I think it's interesting. A prophet's without honor in his own home or maybe his own home country. But Jack, I'd like you to tell him one of the stories you told me off camera about mm -hmm. how uh, you were attacked and the brick hitting you in the face. Would you mind? Well, can, I, can I just delay uh, that a little bit and sure, lead I'll, into it? However lead, you want. Yeah, lead okay. into it. I just want to make sure you get yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I intended, to, uh, intended to mention that. All right. But um, one of the things, now I want you to remember now that I was raised in a Baptist church where I was taught very strongly that the Jewish people were the chosen people and that you don't say anything against them, you don't criticize them in any way at all because if you did, you were going to get in trouble with God over it. But something that I noticed from the very beginning, and that was that whenever I spoke on communism or any related subjects, and my subjects usually were around were along that line, brainwashing, uh, communism, what was happening, uh, sex education in the schools, abortion, this sort of thing that all tied together. Whenever I spoke on communism, the media immediately labeled me as anti-Semitic. I'd never mentioned Jews, I'd never mentioned Judaism, I'd never mentioned Zionism, but they called me anti-Semitic. And then during the Vietnam War years, I worked the college circuit. And this was where I came in contact with these radicals that we're talking about. Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, and some of these guys. At the University of, of, of Kansas, in Lawrence, Kansas, I believe it was in 1982, in April of 1982, uh, I was assaulted by about 12 of them. There were eight, eight uh, boys and four girls. They were the filthiest, most ungodly, 
looking bunch of young people that I'd ever seen. I mean, to the point to where they literally stunk. You wouldn't want to sit down beside them. They smelled so bad. And they were sitting in the front row of the auditorium, maybe eight or 900 people in the auditorium, the other students. We found out later on they weren't even students, but they were allowed in. And they came with bags of marshmallows, and they would put the marshmallows in their mouth and get them sticky, and then they would throw them at me. I had a dark suit on, and wherever it hit my suit, it would stick up against it. So in a little while, I looked like a speckled dog. I looked like my, my Dalmatian hid. One of them sticking on my forehead, a different one. But I'd made up my mind that no matter what they did to me, I wasn't going to let it stop me. So I kept on with his speech. And well, then... You're hmm? the only prophet I know that's been stoned with marshmallows. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. But one of them wasn't a marshmallow. I don't know what it was. But it hit me on the right side, knocked me down, knocked out some teeth, and I got up with the blood flowing down over my, uh, over my suit, ruined my suit, and finished my speech. Uh, I found out later on that uh, all, every one of those 12 in that group were Jew Jewish, every one of them. And here's the thing that I noticed. Every single time, 100% of the time, the leadership of the radical groups was a young Jew from a wealthy Jewish family. This bugged me to the point that in the summer of 1979, I took off for a few months to study this phenomenon, why it was that the Jewish people seemed to be tied in so closely with communism. Now, whenever I mentioned it to my pastor or said anything about it to him, I was shushed right away. Shut up. Don't talk about that. You can't talk about that thing. But it got to the point to where I had to do some investigation. And so I went to Jewish sources. I didn't go to anti-Semitic sources. I went to Jewish writers to see what they had to say about it. And to my amazement, I found out that they bragged about the, the part that they had had in bringing communism into being. For instance, the American Hebrew, which was the largest Jewish newspaper in the United States in April of 1920. I don't remember the exact date. I have it in my, in my, uh, in my files. But it was in April of 1920, came out with an article that said, what we have done, uh, what we did in Russia through Jewish brains and money power, we will do in the United States. Uh, Rabbi Stephen Wise, who was the number one uh, Jewish leader in the United States in the early 1930s was asked, what do you think about communism? He said, don't call it communism, call it Judaism. And then he went on to say, he said, the finest idea or the ideals of Judaism are, uh, I can't remember the word now, but mean in agreement with the finest ideals of communism. And everywhere, everywhere I went, I found Jewish Jewish leaders bragging about what they had done. And the theme behind it all was, we hate Christ, Jesus Christ. Oh, he was a Jew, all right, but we hate him. He was the son of a, he was an illegitimate bastard. He was conceived while his mother was menstruating and everything that would downgrade Jesus Christ. He's in hell now. He's in hell and he's boiling in, in boiling excrement all the way up to his, up to his chin. It was something that I'd never seen before. I never saw it when I was in the seminary. I never read any of this stuff at all. And then I got a hold of a copy of, uh, or several copies of the, uh, the Jewish religious book, the Babylonian Talmud. You remember, Pete, when, when you and Earl Jones and I made a, a tape of this, when we actually had the copies of the Talmud and we read out of the Talmud and showed the people on television screen what it actually said there. That was the English version, the Sancino version, what it said right there in, the, in there. Their hatred of Jesus Christ, and the fact that, uh, that a, it was all right for a grown man to have sexual intercourse with a three-year-old girl because of the fact it didn't hurt her anymore and it would stick in her finger in her eye and stuff like this. The Christian people wouldn't believe it, but it was right there. It was being taught, you see. And I found that, they, that this subject was absolutely verboten. So here's where I got in trouble with the John Birch Society. As I said before, I never ever said anything about Jews or Judaism. One night during the question and answer period, the question was asked, what do you think about our open check policy with the Israelis? And my answer was, I think it's time that the American people take a close second look at where our money is going. 
Two days later, I got a long-distance call from Belmont, and for an hour, Mr. Welsh chewed me out. I mean, he put me on the carpet. He said, you don't say anything about Jews, no matter whether it's true or not. Stay away from the subject of Judaism, Zionism, and anything along that line. Well, I don't know whether it's my German stubbornness or what, but the next time a question came up like that, I went into detail in my answer. And so I got called to Belmont. And Mr. Walsh, Mr. Walsh and the head of the Speaker's Bureau, they went over me with a fine-tooth comb, and I finally stopped him, and I said, Mr. Walsh, if it's gotten to the point in the John Birch Society where I can't speak the truth anymore, you don't need me. I need to go somewhere else. And I left the John Birch Society. Can I interject something mm -hmm. about that? Uh, and I'll tell my audience that's viewing. Um, I was a John Bircher back during the 60s when he was lecturing. I was at the university, United, uh, Colorado State University, and I was a John Bircher and uh, had always had conservative leanings. But when I went off to Bible college, I met a man that gave me a book called The Plot Against Christianity. And he, he said to me something I thought was very strange. He said, when you start learning about the conspiracy from where, what I understand about it, he said, even the John Birchers will persecute you. Well, that, he must have been a prophet of sorts because I, I have to report to you that last year, the John Birch magazine, the, what is it, the American Opinion or the New American Man? Which, mm -hmm. which is it? New, New American. One. New American. New right. American. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, in the New American, the John Birch Society was attacking Pastor Pete Peters. Mm -hmm. So what he said was true. In other words, from what I say about the John Birch Society, they allowed a little bit of truth to get out, but they didn't let you promote Christianity. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, whenever, yeah. yeah, whenever, you see, whenever they talked about what was happening, and they always talked about the establishment. They talked about the establishment, but they never mentioned who the establishment was. And they, they never pinpointed the people that were behind the establishment. And if you began to dig into it and began to talk a little bit about and name names, immediately they clamped down on you. They didn't want Just that like in. they did you. Yeah. Well, I found out at that time, I found out at that time that Mr. Walsh and that society had a, a great deal of financial support from some very wealthy Jews. And he, in fact, he had a few of them on his council of the society, you see. Well, and go, go ahead with your story. I just want to interject so, that. Yeah. So anyway, I, uh, it got to the point to where I, after, after I had studied for three months, that I wrote a letter. Yeah, this was in the fall of 1980. I wrote a letter that I sent to 200 fundamental leaders. I told them a little bit about my background, and I said, many of you know, know me because I've held meetings in your church. But I said, this is what I found out, and I laid down what I found out in my, in my investigation. I said, if I come into your church, I'm not going to make an issue on this. I'm not going to talk about Jews or Judaism or, or Zionism, but I said if the question comes up, I'm going to have to give them an honest answer. And on the basis of that letter and that statement that I made, I had 14 week-long revival services canceled in the next month. It wasn't because I changed my doctrinal teaching at all. It was because I no longer could support the Jews as the chosen people. That was the whole basis on it. So I'd gone to my pastor and went to my pastor and who was, uh, I thought, a close friend of mine. I had helped him out financially on a number of times. We'd had a close, warm relationship. And I went to him and said, Bob, would you let me show you what I'd found out during my study? He knew I was studying. He said, sure. And I sat down and I began to show him in the Bible what I had found out. The minute he found out that it was on the Jewish question, he said, you can't tell me anything what the Bible says about the Jews. I already know it. Don't talk to me about it. Well, you can't deal with a man that won't, that won't look at it. He wouldn't even let me sit down and show, him, show me what I had found in the Bible, you see, about it. And so as a result of that... Kind of pav uh, like a Pavlovian re yeah, reflex. He said, he said, the door of every Baptist church is going to be slammed in your face if you continue this way. And two weeks later, every single Baptist pastor in the state of Mississippi would no longer talk to me. 
Not a one of them. These were men that I had known and had loved and had held revi successful revival meetings in their churches. They would see me coming on the street. They'd walk on the other side of the street because they were scared to meet me. They're afraid. And in the years, the 15 years since that time, I've never had one of those men that ever wrote to me or said, Brother Moore, we'd like to sit down with you and show you where you're wrong out of the Word of God. Not a single one of them has ever done that. No. Well, let me interject something here for the listening audience. That uh, When Colonel Jack Moore came to my church in 1984 and held a revival meeting, after that revival meeting, it ended on a Sunday. The next day, on Monday, in the front page headlines of the Colorado one in Fort Collins, Colorado, were the headlines that says, Evangelist Outrages Area Jews. And the print was the size of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And the community was thrown into an uproar. And the Ministerial Alliance, remember the Ministerial Alliance? They came out and made a statement against us. And so what I did was I advertised in the paper all of Jack Moore's messages, and even if I remember right, offered it for any minister that wanted to hear those messages. And Jack, the interesting thing was there was not one minister in the entire community that was willing to even hear one of your messages. We had them all on cassette tape. Well, if you remember, Pete, too, that that uh, I offered, and I think you put it on the radio, I offered to have a breakfast at one of the, one of the motels there where we could meet the preachers from the Ministerial Alliance and sit down as Christian gentlemen and discuss this in a Christian manner, and not a single one of them would attend. You remember? I had forgotten until you just yeah. brought it up. Yeah, not a single one of them would attend. And if you remember, too, the first night when I spoke, I gave my testimony on Korea. I never mentioned Jews, Judaism, Zionism, or anything like that. And a, paper, a letter in the, to the editor, if you remember, the meeting ended about 10 o'clock, and there was a, a Jewish lady, if you remember, that was there, that we noticed her in the crowd. And that uh, the, the Denver Post goes to print about 12 o'clock at night. 80 miles away or thereabouts. And the next morning there was a letter to the editor and said, I sat in in Pastor Pete Peter's church, words to this effect, and I heard a man that sounded like Adolf Hitler last night. It made my blood run cold. And I'd never mentioned anything about Jews, Judaism, or anything, which indicated to me that that letter was prepared a long time before I ever got the, the Laporte. And the whole thing, the whole thing was, from the beginning to an end, was a setup. You could see it. Any intelligent person could see that it was a setup, but the Christian ministers wouldn't even, wouldn't even look at the facts at all. They weren't interested in it. They didn't want to look at the facts. And I think one of the reasons why, and excuse the French, but it's true, it scares hell out of them. It scares hell out of them to know what's happening, and as a result of that, they turn their back on it. Well, what's the Bible say, Jack? For fear of the what? You hear of the Jews right. over and over and over again. Well, now, you've made the connection in your study, then, between Judaism and communism. Uh, you were brave enough to start speaking out against this open check policy to the Zionists in Israel. But also, then, along the way, you made an interesting discovery. Well, yes. Uh, I, I was told by Baptist theologians, of course, in fact, when I was going to, uh, when I was going to the seminary, uh, there were questions in my mind even then. And I would ask, I remember on two different occasions, one question I asked was, uh, what did Jesus mean over there in John 10 and 26 when he spoke to the Jewish authorities and he said, ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. Now, I said, that seems pretty clear to me. And the professor glared at me, as I remember, and said, set down and quit rocking the boat and shut up. That was a, I asked another question a little bit later on. I said, what did Jesus mean when he told the Jewish authorities, you go over land and sea to make one convert, and when you made a convert, you turn him into twofold more a child of hell than yourselves. I said, that doesn't sound chosen people to me. And I got the same reaction. They would not answer. The college professors wouldn't answer. They wouldn't even attempt to tell you what it meant, even though that was what they were there for, you see. And I began to realize that somewhere along the line, 
somewhere along the line, somebody's got a, a stranglehold on these people that they're scared to that they're scared to tell the truth. Then I was told by the theologians that the Jews are all of Israel. Israel disappeared when they were in, the tribes of Israel disappeared when they were in Assyrian captivity. Nothing is left to now but the Jews. And then when I pointed out from Jewish sources that 90% of the Jewish people weren't Semitic, that they were Turco-Mongolian by background, and that their ancestors never set foot in, in Palestine, and that all the prime ministers of the Israeli nation, not a single one of them, their ancestors ever came from Palestine. They came from Russia, from southern Russia. The Jewish authorities admitted it, you see, and they would turn their back on that. So then I began, the question in my mind was, if the Jews aren't Israel, who is Israel? Oh, they said Israel's disappeared, but I knew from reading my Bible that wasn't true because God said in the promises he made to Abraham that as long as the sun and the moon and the stars exist, so long will Israel exist. And so I began looking around. Let me interject something that might be of interest to you, and that is that I remember when I was in Bible college in my James class, the book of James, James 1.1 1, 1 says to the James, an apostle of God, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Mm -hmm. And I raised my hand and said, you know, this says the 12 tribes dispersed abroad, and I was told that the 10 northern tribes went out of existence. Mm -hmm. And so my, my Bible college instructor said, well, that means the church mm -hmm. but I just thought I would put that in yeah. and I might also mention for someone watching this if they want a good source as to to show that the people called Jews today are not basically Semites but go back to the Turco Mongolian stock that you mentioned a good book would be the 13th tribe by Arthur mm. Kosler I can honestly say and I think that I think that you'll agree with me because you've heard many of my messages, you've read many of my books, that I've never deliberately uh, tried to attempt to attack the Jewish people on the basis that they were Jews. I would take the same stand against a Methodist or a Baptist or a Catholic if he was trying to destroy Christianity and openly trying to destroy it and openly said they were going to destroy it. And even openly undermine the foundations of what this great republic yeah. was resting And the on. thing is that when the leadership, when the leadership of a group of people come out and says, this is our plan, this is what we're going to do, what we did in Russia, we're going to do also in the United States. And we're going to bring about this new world order. This is what they said. This is our baby, and we're going to bring it about. And when we get done, your religion is going to be gone, buddy. This is what they say. And the Christian ministers say, that isn't what they meant. That isn't what they meant. You remember when Khrushchev came to the United Nations and he banged on the podium and he says, we're going to bury you. John Kenneth Galbraith from Harvard said he didn't really mean that. He meant they were going to pass us economically. And Khrushchev got back to Russia and according to Pravda, he said, I went to America and I spit in their faces and they thought it was due. Well, back okay. on the story of... Uh of the identity message. Let's go that right. way. You, you started asking the same question that I asked before mm -hmm. I even knew you, and that is, well, if the Jews today are not the Israel people, the Hebrew people of the Bible, mm -hmm. then who are? Well, who do you, you know, my question was then, how do you go about locating these people the, uh, if they're not by that name anymore? And so I began uh, an intense study into the Word of God, and I found that there were over 200 fingerprints that identify what Israel is going to be like in the closing out days of this age that we're here. One of them was that they're going to be a great nation and a company of nations. The Jews have never qualified there. Another thing was going to be that they were going to carry the gospel message to the far ends of the earth. The Jews have never done that. It's been the white Anglo-Saxon and related people that have carry down 98% of the missionary efforts. They're the ones that print the Bibles and send out the Christian influence. They're going to be people that when there's a great national disaster somewhere like a flood, they're going to send aid to them. They're going to be the ones that are going around the world trying to heal the sick people. Where does the help come from as far as, as aid to sick people comes? 
doesn't come from the colored nations. You can't point to a single colored nation who has ever openly accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only way they've accepted it is with a great deal of work, a great deal of money, and sometimes with a great deal of danger. Ask the missionaries that ended up in a cooking pot, you see. You see, the only the, the, these nations that we call Christendom today that have built their constitutions on the Word of God, on the Ten Commandments, they don't speak the same language. Their customs aren't always the same, but their heart's language is the same. They feel the same. All of these people here have the work ethic that the Apostle Paul spoke about when he said, he that will not work shall not eat, you know. They have the work ethic. They believe in the sanctity of the family. They are passionately freedom-loving people, all of them. They believe, in, they believe in setting a woman up on a pedestal. They don't believe in tromping her down into the dirt, you see. And all of these things were signs that pointed back to, uh, to the, uh, the, the nations of Christendom. And then I ran across a very interesting true story that took place in England in the late 1800s. Back in those days, they had gypsies going around. I don't know if you're old enough to remember when they used to have gypsies in this country, and I remember when I was a little boy. My father told me about them. Yeah, my mother would tell me, you better behave yourself or the gypsies are going to get you. They would wander around in the summertime in their wagons. And a little boy from an English family disappeared, two years old. He disappeared, and uh, they couldn't find him. The police couldn't locate him. His father thought he was dead, but his mother, like mothers are, was sure that somewhere he was alive. One day, about 40 years later, th this family got a letter from a lawyer in, in Spain, and he said uh, an old gypsy woman on her deathbed confessed to stealing a little boy from this village and told the time when it happened, could it possibly be your son? And it was from their village, and it was about the same time that they had lost the little girl boy. So the mother wrote back and said, my son, if it's him, will have three identifying marks. He said when he was just a small boy, one day he was carrying the family parrot on his shoulder, and he picked up a, a kitten, and the parrot got mad and bit off the lower part of his left earlobe. Said he also has a scar on the inside of his right leg, about six inches above the ankle, about six inches long, that he, that he hurt himself when he was small. And then he said, as a last thing, look between his shoulder blades and you'll find a strawberry birthmark. Several months went by because of communication being very slow in those times. They had to go by boat. When the word came back, I checked him out. His earlobe is missing. He's got a scar on the inside of his right leg, and he's got a birthmark between his shoulder blades. And the mother and father, in ecstasy, sold their property in order to make the trip to Spain. And when they got there, they took him up into a, a mountain, up in the Pyrenees Mountains, and introduced him to a dark, swarthy, long-haired, bearded fellow. Didn't look like an Englishman. Couldn't speak a word of English. He didn't know anything about their God or anything about their heritage at all. And the mother's heart fell, fell. And then she noticed his earlobe was missing. And so the interpreter, she asked him to pull his pant leg up, and there was the scar. And then she had him take off his shirt, and between his shoulder blades was the strawberry birthmark. And she threw her arms around him and accepted him as her son. He didn't know, he'd forgotten about their family, about, the, about his father's God. He had forgotten about his family background. He had no connections with England at all, but he had the fingerprints that identified him as their son. And that's what the Anglo-Saxon people have, the fingerprints that are in the Word of God that prove that they and they only are of the, tri are of the family of Abraham. They were the form of multitude of nations. Yeah. They were to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. My sheep hear my voice. You mentioned the a heart. God said he would write in the new covenant the law on the heart of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The and thing, Pete, the thing that I can't understand, well, yes, I can understand it in a way because I did it for 50 years, is why ministers who study the word of God, and they can see these things, it's in there. 
why it is that they insist that somebody that hates everything that they stand for, that they insist that they're the chosen people, and yet when you say, no, we are, oh, they ought to be thrilled with the fact that possibly we're the children of Abraham, but instead of that, they say, oh, no, we're Goyim. We're well, Gentiles. They'll even call you a racist. Yeah, you're a racist and if a you think that. And a hater. You're a racist and you hate her if you hate, if you love your people, but if what? you love your people and want something good for them, you see. This is, un, uh, it is very, very difficult for me to understand. But what you've tried to do is to, and you've written a lot of books, tried to show the identifying marks of Israel, right. the Hebrew people, and how they relate to the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian kingdom. Yeah, that, now here, here, for instance, is one book, the... America's Destiny. Why don't you hold that up? So yeah, see. America's Destiny, which has three different messages in it. Well, tell uh, them about it. Three different messages in here that have to do about, uh, about what's happened. Let me give you just a, who are we, for instance, is one of the messages that are there. Background to betrayal, how we've been betrayed by not only our political people, but also by our religious leaders. Here's another one, the mystery of true Israel. Who is true Israel? What are the identifying marks that prove who true Israel is? Are we just going to take the word of some Jewish leader that says we're the ones? Are we going to take the, uh, are we going to take uh, the word of somebody like Jack Van Empey who says the Jews are the chosen people? Or where are we going to find out? Where, what is the source of our information? And we've got to come back every time to the Word of God. Every time, you see. Why don't you go through some of these other books, Bill? This one here is a, the, actual, the actual communist uh, textbook for the, the blueprint for the takeover of the United States, written in 1934, taught to a group of 47 American students who went to the University of Moscow, Lenin School of Psychopolitical Warfare, 45 of them were Jews, by the way, interesting, and then came back and were the nucleus of the uh, trouble that we saw on our college campuses during the Vietnam War. This is the blueprint for the takeover of America, and it will make your blood run cold and your hair stand on end when you see how they're following identical is this. Also a tie-in with something that most church leaders laugh at, and they scoff, the satanic counterfeit. Uh, the study of the protocols of the elders of Zion, which they say is counterfeit. The interesting thing is, in order to have a counterfeit, you've got to have an original. Yeah, I, I remember one time where you were slammed pretty badly because you made that statement, you know. And in order to have a counterfeit, you've got, you've got to have an original. Yes. And the counterfeiter tries to make it as close to the original as possible to fool people. The question isn't, is it a counterfeit, but are they following this plan? And just like this one here, they're following it like a blueprint. They have been for 100 years. Christianity's ancient enemy. And then probably one of the most interesting ones that Pastor Pete helped me get into print, the effect of the Talmud on Judeo-Christianity. What has been the effect of this Jewish religious book? And in here, I have page after page after page of photostatic copies right out of the Jewish Talmud that shows you exactly what it says and what it teaches. Talks about some of the symbols, that, the symbolism that is used, some of the occult, occultism that is used and how it is used to brainwash people, particularly our Christian leaders. Let me interject something here. Uh, do you want them to write to me for the books or do you want them to write to you? I would rather have them write to you. I, um, when I moved uh, from the Gulf Coast up to Little Rock uh, in May of last year, uh, I was planning on going into semi-retirement. Uh, and strangely enough, I, I've been busier, I guess, in the, in the last eight months than I have been in two years. And uh, the Lord evidently has other plans for me. I was developing some squeaks and rattles after all the miles of that, the hard miles I had on this old chassis. I thought I was about ready for the junk heap, but evidently God had other plans for me. 
And uh, so I turned all my literature over to, uh, to Pastor Pete. And so if you want any of this literature, I would suggest that you write to Scripture for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. They can give you a list of the material that I have and the prices for them. And uh, again, the address is Scriptures for America or the Laporte Church of Christ, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Just write and request a list of Colonel Jack Moore's material. We're carrying all his books, and we intend to keep them in print. Uh, so if you write to us for that, we'll send them to you, uh, a list of the books and, and the prices. Uh, you never know when this video is going to be watched. Somebody might be watching this video. We're making it in February of 1996, but they might be watching it in five years from now. Yes. And mm -hmm. so uh, we want to make sure your books are kept in print, and we intend to keep printing them. And I want it to be known now, we just will make it uh, known by videotape, that I have permission from you to keep printing these books and putting them out. Yes, that's right. Uh, I have given uh, Pastor Peters the, uh, the the books are not copyrighted, and I've given him permission to uh, handle these books in any way that he's he's fit. If he wants to reprint them, and uh, they're to be used for his scriptures for uh, America ministry. Well, we've got about ten minutes left. You just go wherever you want to go with this. Well. I, I think it might be worthwhile to say, uh, I think it might be worthwhile to say that I have received a great deal more uh, criticism from Judeo-Christian sources, uh, from Christian sources than I have from, from Judeo-Christian sources. A great deal more uh, criticism that uh, this seems to be a a better subject for the Judeo-Christian churches to handle. They're scared to death of it. And men like Van Empey and Weber and Paul Crouch from Trinity Broadcasting System and Jerry Falwell and Pat Robinson and all these fellows there have flat out stated that if it came to the decision as to what is best for America, what was best for the Israelis, they'd have to go along with the Israelis. Now, I don't know how you feel about that. I call that treason. I call that treason not only to God, but I also call it treason to the United States of America. You know, Jack, one of the books that you have, I think it's, let's see here, the one entitled, Thank God My Savior Was Not a Jew. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you elaborate on that a little bit? Because a lot of people they say, how can you say that Jesus was not a Jew? Well, the, the word Jew, as I was coming to the identity message, is, was very confusing to me mm -hmm. uh, because it can refer to people in Judea, it can refer to people from the tribe of Judah. Today, it can refer to a group of people that follow the Talmud. Mm -hmm. Would you want to elaborate on that a little? Yeah, this is probably this is probably the most controversial book that I have written. I've received the uh, more criticizing, criticism for this. It is a um, very well documented book, I think. I go back, uh, in most cases, to Jewish sources to prove what I'm talking about here and to historical sources. And the fact that Jesus wa came from the house of David, of the tribe of Judah, very, very, very few people from the tribe of Judah today are Jews. Even in the time of Christ, very few were. At that time, there were two groups of, primarily that were Jewish people at the time of Jesus, and most of those were Edomites. Now you can see that if you do a little studying in the eighth chapter of the book of John. Jesus talking to the Pharisees said to them words to the effect, if you would know the truth, the truth will set you free. And the Jewish leader said, we are the children of Abraham, and we have never been in bondage to anybody. Well, anybody that's ever studied a Sunday school lesson at all knows that the Israel people were in bondage in Egypt, and they were in bondage in Assyria. And Babylon. Yeah, and Babylon. So the only people that these could refer to 
are the people that we know as Edomites. Who also had Abraham as their father. Yeah, who also had Abraham as their father, but not through, not through, uh, not through the, through Jacob Israel, who was to become the, the father of Israel, but through uh, Esau, who God said very clearly, very strange words here, the book of Malachi, in chapter 1. Look at that just a minute. God speaking now. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountain and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Listen carefully now. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they will build up and I will throw down, and they will call them the border of wickedness, the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. You think about that for just a minute. The people in Palestine today, known as the Israelis, says we are the chosen people. And God says you're Edomites, those of you that are not aliens and Khazars, you're Edomites, I hated your father, I hate you, you're going to build up and I'm going to tear down what you're building up. Now just for you saying that, there will be some people, particularly ministers, that will see that and they will reject it because they have been programmed to say, well, God doesn't hate anyone. But yet this same uh, statement is made in Romans. He said, Jacob I love, Esau I hate. Yeah, it's, it's in right the, there in the Word. Yeah, it's in the New Testament. It's not only in the Old Testament, right. you see. And uh, so uh, as a result, our, our people have been so brainwashed into, uh, into believing that when you talk about in fact, in most cases in the King James Version, which I happen to use, in most cases in the King James Version, the word Jew should read Judean instead of Jew. Well, I might also point out here that uh, historically it's proven that John Hyrcanus, when he conquered the Edomites, what, about 200 years before Christ, it says he forced them to uh, become Jews. Yes, that's right. He forced them to become Jews. So the, uh, the important thing today, would you not agree, is that people that truly love truth in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. they need to know who his enemies are, mm -hmm. and they need to know the difference between Jacob and Esau. Would you agree? Oh, yes, very much so. Another very interesting thing, too, that I think is very important and that many of our people uh, shy away from is found over in uh, Hosea, uh, Hosea chapter 1, uh, verse 10. Listen to what it says here now. Today, uh, the Judeo-Christian pastors call Christians Gentiles. You and I are Gentiles. But listen to what it says here. The number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. The Jews have never at any time in their existence have ever been more than 20 million people. They couldn't come under this at all. But listen to what it says. It shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, ye are not my people, and that's what the Jewish people and the Judeo-Christian people, they're saying, you're not God's people, you're a Gentile. There it will be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. Christians, in other words. Right. Isn't that strange? And Isn't that strange? And they neglect that verse completely. They throw that out. You see. By the way, I want the people to see... Jack Moore's Bible. <laughs> Don't tell me Jack Moore doesn't study his Bible. Uh, I don't know if you can see that or not, but that's just one of the pages he's got all marked up. Jack, uh, I appreciate you so much, how you've studied the Bible, how you spent your life being true to your promise to God that you would pursue truth and do labors for him as he would direct you. Well, Pete... And in closing, would you want to tell the people why this is important for them to investigate this truth that you found? Yeah, I, uh, 
I don't want the people to have the idea that I have hatred for the Jewish people because I don't have hatred for the Jewish people. I have a great deal of sympathy for the Jewish people because the Jewish people are having the same problem that many of the people in the Masonic Lodge are having at the lower ranks. They don't know what's going on topside. They don't know what the plans are. They don't realize the, and there have been some courageous Jewish leaders who have said that the most of the damage that is done to the Jewish people is done by our leadership. So I'm not, I'm not out to hurt Jewish people. I'm out to protect my people. And if it means that I have to expose what's happening, that's my job. The Word of God tells me that my job is to reprove and to rebuke before I exhort. Before I tell you how great you are and how much God needs you in his business, I'm supposed to tell him what's going on that's wrong. That comes first. And so as a result, and if we are going to protect ourselves, if we are going to save our religion, if we're going to save our right to worship God, we're going to have to know the truth about what's happening so that we can so that we can take the only formula for survival that's available to us found in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. Many of you people that hear this are, know it. You're pitted in your churches all the time. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I'll forgive your sin, and I'll heal your land, and it's just words, lip service that you're given to it, because you don't really believe it. You can tell by their fruits you shall know them. But that is our formula for survival, isn't That's it? the formula for survival. God says it will work. We know God's promise is true, but we have to put it in operation. Colonel Moore, don't you think part of that humbling process, with my people will humble themselves, is to say, hey, we've been wrong on some things in the Bible, just like you've had to admit and I've had to admit and then accept the truth as God gives it to us? Well, I want to tell you, Pete, it's one of the most difficult things in the world that I can think of as I look back on it, to have spent years and years and years and years preaching one thing and then finally to have to stand up before people and say, I was wrong. I didn't mean to mislead you, but I was wrong. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's, it's something that's necessary. I believe that's what it means when it said, turn from our wicked ways. Amen. Jack, you've done well, and you have nothing to gain with this interview. You have nothing to gain even selling the books. I'm the one that sells the books. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank you on behalf of my church, on behalf of my grandchildren, on behalf of people all across America that know Jack Moore and love him. I want to thank you for being so diligent in keeping your promise you made to God and doing such a great work and being a humble man yourself and coming to this truth. Thank it's, you for this interview. Yeah, just one thing that I can say and that is without him I can do nothing. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jack.